Well, welcome everyone. This is our second uh, uh, entry in this week's uh, Open Educational Week uh, schedule for the LibreText. We have a very uh, exciting uh, and uh, expansive week planned. Um, so one of the goals that we had uh, for today's presentations was to give an overview of the Libreverse. Uh, and that's the, again, the gist of this presentation. And we'll be discussing different aspects of the Libreverse uh, in different presentations later on this week. And I encourage you to take a look at our blog, uh, which can be found at blog.libretext.org, uh, or Jennifer can put the link uh, in the chat for people to be able to find the other links that we, or the other presentations that we have. So with that, I'll get started. Okay, so uh, who am I? Um, so my name is Delmar Larson. Uh, I'm a professor of chemistry uh, at the University of California, Davis. I've been here since 2005, so it's been close to 17 years uh, in the Central Valley of California. My research focus is on ultrafast laser spectroscopies of photoactive biological systems. Uh, basically, I have a big laser system that shoots laser pulses into biological things, uh, typically proteins, and I look at how they evolve in time uh, and use that in order to elucidate how we can uh, elucidate the techniques and the underlying principles that can be used in order to construct new materials that are out there. However, we're not here to talk about ultrafast laser spectroscopies, although I certainly would love to do so. Uh, we're here to discuss the LibreText project. Project. Um, I'm the founder and director of the LibreText project. It was established in 2008, uh, then as the Kim Wiki, um, but then rebranded into the LibreText project about seven years ago uh, as essential branding. Uh, I'm the chair, co-chair of the UC Davis Aggie Open, which is an OER program uh, for my campus. Uh, I'm an adopter of OER. I'm an adapter of OER. I'm a creator of OER and I'm a curator of OER. And it's important for me to emphasize these components because it, it really emphasizes that uh, the perspectives that I give in terms of OER and where OER should go is a very practitioner oriented perspective in contrast to uh, an advocate based perspective or a librarian based perspective or um, even a commercial based perspective on things. Um, the, the practitioner aspect of me means that I carry different hats. Uh, I have not used a, a commercial textbook in a classroom for about 10 years now, um, and uh, that has been fun in some cases, uh, in other cases it's been quite painful, um, but it's a, a component associated with the way that I view OER and the way that I view myself here. Uh, so it was clear for me since I became a professor at UC Davis uh, back in 2005 that I was part of a system that was involved in perpetuating unaffordable education for students. Uh, and that right there is important uh, for me as an instructor in order to address because the unaffordability of textbooks and unaffordability of resources in general uh, meant that I was unable to achieve the mission that I had in terms of maximizing the education that I give to my students. Uh, and that by itself is hands down more than enough reason in order to be able to pursue OER uh, across the board, despite uh, other reasons that I have there more personal uh, in advancing OER that's out there. So let's start this conversation uh, with the LibreText mission that we have here. So we are implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Each of these words that's bolded here are particularly important in terms of defining who we are uh, and our goals in moving forward uh, with our project. Each of the four words that are in the parentheses here is construction, curation, adoption, adaption is also quite critical in defining who we are, uh, at least from a practical standpoint, uh, in terms of being able to understand uh, what is necessary in order to be able to advance OER, again, from a practitioner's perspective on things. Um, so just to comment on a few of the terms in this mission, community means you. It means anyone who wants to contribute to the project, whether they're faculty, their student, their external experts, anybody who actually has content or has something to contribute to the project, we want to be able to facilitate and mobilize them effectively instead of having it getting lost in the crowd. And I'm, unfortunately, there's a lot of effort that's being lost in the crowd because of the way that things are decentralized out there. We take a different approach in the LibreText uh, effort. Um, OER uh, can be defined uh, uh, quite extensively over a long period of time. I'm just going to, for the sake of this conversation, say freely available or freely licensed and leave it at that. If you want to have a conversation behind that, then I encourage us to have a discussion after my presentation. Um, 
LibreTex is comprehensive. Now, while the LibreTex project was born out of a precursor project called the ChemWiki, which again, obviously focused on chemistry, uh, it's expanded its scope both horizontally and vertically. So horizontally across all the fields in academia. So in other words, we follow a no gap left behind policy. If there's a particular interest in a specific field that's of use for academia in order to advance uh, educational goals, then we have a desire in order to maintain it and host it within our infrastructure uh, and capitalize on what we've established in order to be able to promote that for the better net for bettering OER and academic in general. Uh, we also follow a no, no tech left behind policy, which essentially means that the technology that we have implemented with the Libreverse uh, much of it, actually almost all of it, is open source. Uh, much of it we've created, much of it we've also commandeered on other uh, repositories or other people's code because it's capitalizing on the sharing is caring model around open source technology, which is also the same model underlying OER. Uh, and that means we follow a no tech left behind policy. When uh, new code has been uh, uh, generated and is available for people to capitalize on, we'll internalize it within the Libreverse and provide the opportunity for anyone who uses the Libreverse to capitalize on that technology without having to learn how to implement it and go through the details associated with the issues of that. So we go through the pain so that people who use a Libreverse don't have to. Uh, and lastly, the content that we have is curated, which means that we go through a lot of effort, not just to host our content, but to constantly update our content for a variety of different reasons, whether that means in order to, to uh, fix issues that need to be addressed, whether it means to update content for emerging sensibilities or emerging or changing needs. Uh, we don't view OER, uh, or at least the need of the, the of the Libreverse as a publishing of a book. Uh, that right there is just the start of what's necessary. We need to be able to curate it, cultivate it, and move it forward. And that is a clear distinction between how we operate as an entity and other uh, OER platforms operate, which are largely just basically saying, here's the platform, and that's the end of the game. Uh, for us, it's just the beginning. So we have a series of curation boards in order to facilitate uh, uh, adapting or, or updating content, uh, and then we uh, we respond routinely uh, to people's responses uh, via uh, various mechanisms in order to update uh, the, corpus that, the corpus that we are maintaining. So um, I mentioned the, this, I should say it again, uh, this week uh, we are celebrating our 15th year anniversary. Um, so we've been around 15 years, which means that we're a somewhat mature project in the OER landscape. Uh, we will also be celebrating this month our 1 billionth page view. Um, so we've delivered 1 billion page views and somewhere between five to seven millennia of confirmed reading of content on our infrastructure. So we're very excited with where we've gone and where we've come from and where we're going. Um, and we hope the next 15 years to be very beneficial uh, for everybody. So in this conversation, I want to uh, throw out several definitions just to try to avoid some of the confusions that uh, may come out there. We're, we like a lot of terms for a lot of components in our Libreverse that uh, have a connection to the Libra text name, hence the word Libra. Um, we're trying to uh, downgrade that a little bit, but it, it sometimes can be confusing. So I want to actually give out several definitions of particular note for this conversation. One is the term LibreText is the brand name for our entire project, our entire effort, our team, our company. It's the LibreText infrastructure. The Libreverse is the practical manifestation of our effort. It is the ecosystem of courseware that we've established of interconnected, interconnected technologies in order to be able to promote open uh, for authors, for learners, for instructors, instructors across the board, again, from a practitioner's perspective out there. The LibreNet, which I'll mention a couple times during this presentation, is the consortium that we established several years ago of campuses, systems, or states that can join for maximal use of the Libreverse. Essentially, campuses can join in, uh, have a few additional benefits associated with it that you don't get when you're not joined, and that helps to maintain our sustainability because we need to sustain the efforts that we've uh, built over the last 15 years. Uh, then we throw uh, the term Libra in a variety of other technologies. Uh, typically, they're associated with the central technologies uh, of the Libraers. For example, we'll talk about Libra Commons, which is our central campus, campus commons, one of the technologies that we use for cataloging and project management development. We have the Libra Studio, which we're going to just refer to the studio in the near future, uh, which hosts our H5P repository uh, and a handful of other uh, Libra-related contents. 
again, we're trying to downgrade that in order to keep things a little bit more centralized so it provides less confusion uh, uh, out there. So I mentioned this before. This is unfortunately an old slide that doesn't show the most up-to-date version. Like I said, this month, we're going to be celebrating our one, mil one billionth with the B page view. So in other words, over one billion page views served since we've uh, delivered uh, with many millennia of uh, student reading. We host about uh, a half a million pages of content. We prefer to use pages as the relevant component for uh, describing the, our corpus of content, not books, because one book may be several orders of magnitude bigger than another book that's out there. Um, and we have somewhere in the order of about two and a half thousand books of content uh, that's put out there. So what is the Libreverse? Well, the Libreverse, again, like I mentioned before, is a manifestation of the efforts that the Libre Text Project is used in order to maintain uh, uh, our corpus of OER content and to distribute it. So there are three primary focuses associated with the Libreverse. One is as a construction platform of OER or uh, whether that has be textbooks or assessments uh, of various forms or ancillary materials that we use. One is as a dissemination platform. In fact, we're the uh, the most popular centralized dissemination platform of OER content on the internet today, um, uh, or at least of OER textbooks. It's hard to compete with Wikipedia um, that's out there. Um, like I mentioned, that one billion page view is a reflection of the magnitude of our dissemination infrastructure. Uh, and then as a learning platform, and this is where the instructor in me comes in. I want to be able to use OER effectively, and I want to be able to uh, evaluate learning effectively, uh, because I think that's important in order to be able to know if OER is good or bad, uh, or at least say good or better than good. Uh, that's out there. Uh, so we use it as a learning platform, and that involves a range of different components to it. Analytics is one of the key components, uh, in addition to a handful of other things uh, that's in place. So this is a, a picture that I'm going to be showing several times during my presentation. It's a quick snapshot of the Libreverse. Uh, and the idea behind this is that we have a core set of libraries, which constitutes the hub of our Libreverse. There are 15 independently operating libraries, which host content associated with specific field or specific subsection of fields. For example, the chemistry library, the physics library. We have a social sciences library, humanities library, um, a workforce library and, and such. <clears throat> uh, those are independently operating wikis, um, and I'll mention why we chose that technology um, in a moment. Complementing those libraries is a suite of interconnected technologies in order to be able to advance these concepts of a textbook to be the nature of the book or nature of the OER that we want to be able to distribute. In other words, the, the concept of a textbook is changing in time. Uh, publishers have understood this for a while. They've diversified their portfolio and what they provide to instructors and students. And we felt that it was necessary in order to reflect that diversity in our in building of the Libreverse. So we don't focus on one specific field like these are just textbooks uh, or this is just homework or this is just analytics. We have an overall uh, ecosystem that's the better than that's greater than some of the parts uh, uh, and because it's a not-for-profit entity uh, it's significantly cheaper uh, or free uh, uh, for the community um, with 10 times the power than many of the other uh, alternative platforms have out there um, so let's just talk about the libraries to begin with uh, uh, so before going into the library uh, in detail we want to talk about the basis of how we and why we do what we do. So the OER landscape uh, is heavily fragmented. And there is OER content found in a variety of different sources out there. You could find OER content in the Open Textbook Library. Actually, to be specific, you can find links to OER content. Uh, it's mostly a referatory or a library guide than a true library, but nonetheless, it's a useful place in order to find OER. OER Commons is also referatory, although it does have some uh, capabilities of constructing and storing content. OpenStax uh, hosts its own content and only its own content content. Merlot is a good repository, which has expanded a little bit with some a referatory expanded with repository. Open SUNY, Galileo, Open Oregon, NOBA, BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, Alberta, Hawaii, Sailor, California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, uh, uh, Oregon State University, 
uh, and such. Uh, there's a wealth of various places that OER can be found on the internet. Uh, and there's a lot more than this uh, as new repositories are generated uh, in new campuses, new states. And there's a whole lot of OER, what would be considered OER, that's hosted on individual faculties' hard drives across the, the country. Uh, and the issue that we have here is when it's decentralized, first, it makes it difficult in order to find the content, although things have improved a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, after that. But it makes it easier in order to curate the content and move it forward. Because when you have various copies of books in various places, and one person updates it, it makes it difficult in order for another person who has a different version in a different state to be able to benefit from that, because it's decentralized. Uh, and we want to be able to take a different approach that we feel is necessary in order to be able to make it so that every step forward is truly a step forward instead of potentially a step sideways or a step that doesn't go anywhere. Um, so, And that's necessary because, again, the, uh, the infrastructure around academia is heavily fragmented. Uh, uh, both in fields and departments and things like that. So we want to do is take OER content, whether it's OER content that we've created or OER co content that's been created by students within our infrastructure or OER content that's created by other people and capitalizing on the O in OER, essentially making it because it's an open license, it means it's sharing and follows the sharing is caring model uh, out there. So we commandeer, we ingest content, uh, OER content into our infrastructure uh, in order to standardize it and make it easier so people can mix and match content and remix and build and customize their own book as effectively as possible and as painlessly as possible. And that process is what we refer to as harvesting, because it's not just copying it in, it's copying and polishing and standardizing and applying accessibility and making sure that the standard is all in place, so that we can essentially make a big bucket of Legos. So that when an instructor comes in and they want to be able to create a book, they can grab bits and pieces of various components of, uh, of the Lego blocks within our corpus, the various pieces that are standardized, and build their book with less pain. So in other words, if this box of Legos gets super big, then the instructor, in this case here, the child in the picture, is essentially only limited by his or her imagination. Uh, and that's where we're trying to go, is to build that corpus as big and as strong as possible and standardize off of it. We centralize the content. Um, we standardize the content, we make it so it's interconvertible. We can build collections, AKA books or other sort of mini repositories out there. It provides maximal flexibility. It provides maximal curatability. Because again, because it's centralized, when you fix one page and one mistake somewhere, everyone else that uses it, that page in their book, then benefits from it. And you don't have that in any other system that's heavily fragmented across the board. So in order to facilitate this, we have a corpus of a half a million pages of content and growing rapidly right now. We need the technology in order to facilitate slicing and dicing this content effectively. So four and a half years ago, we introduced the OER Remixer. Um, the OER Remixer uh, several months ago just received an award from the Open Education, uh, Open OE Global uh, for their uh, excellence, the same people who are running uh, Open Ed Week. Um, and the idea behind the Remixer uh, is it's a graphical interface that faculty can grab pages of content from any book anywhere in our corpus and just basically rearrange those pages in order to build a book. It's a simple drag and drop in order to be able to generate a book rapidly in order to be able to build it. So it makes it effective and quick in order to build a customized book without having to slice and dice these things. What's really effective off of here is not only being able to identify content based on where things are, but you can also do searches through meta tags and identify different pages that address the same topic that you may be able to search off of here. Um, it's a very effective uh, tool uh, and it's our first go-to tool when we're rebuilding uh, or building or remixing content that's out there. Each of our libraries are organized roughly in three general categories. We have content that's stored in central bookshelves. We have content that's stored in our, sorry, our campus bookshelves. Then we have our central bookshelves and then we have our learning objects. So every page represents a quantum uh, within the remixer. You can build uh, content on a page, but you can remix content page by page. Those pages, when they're organized as a book, those books can be in the central bookshelves. Those are the ones that, that are centrally curated by the curation team. Again, curation is a key component that addresses how we are and what we move forward. Uh, 
Um, however, there are people who want to customize. So you can customize your own books and store them in campus bookshelves. And those are, again, curated by the individuals off of there. We don't typically touch them with the exception of accessibility issues that we want to be able to go through because we want to maintain a certain standard across the content uh, on our corpus. Um, but this provides the flexibility of customizing content, but the stability associated with a centralization approach. And we have a nice little way in order to be able to make it so you can actually benefit from uh, building customized content that's centralized called transclusion, but I'm not going to be able to discuss that in detail today. The last component here are learning objects. Learning objects are pages of content that are not well organized around books, but they're organized around other sort of organizations like uh, chemistry laboratories. Uh, so we have wet labs and dry labs and worksheets and other visualizations. These are learning objects that are that can be used in order to build customized books uh, here, but they're not well organized as a central bookshelf and you wouldn't be able to find it right there when that's out there. Okay, so there are several key aspects that we're particularly proud of within our libraries, but I wanna emphasize two of them uh, here. One is that we have a new auto attribution feature. So again, our perspective in building the Libreverse is based around practitioners' perspective of things. And one of the biggest pain that we have with a, uh, as many of you probably already know with OER is to make sure that you are 100% compliant with the licensing of the content that you are using. Uh, now, if you're creating all your own OER content, that's really not much of an issue because you're the intellectual property owner. But if you're remixing from other people's content, as a lot of OER is out there and as what OER is designed for doing, it could be difficult in order to maintain compliance with the licensing, making sure that you have proper attributions out there, and to make sure that the licensing that you apply is consistent with the licensing that uh, comes from the content out there. Um, this is a topic of multiple hours in order to discuss properly, but what we've implemented into our libraries is what we, what we refer to as spray painting. We're essentially tag each paragraph with the uh, with the attribution information for that paragraph. So if you copy content from one paragraph of our library onto another paragraph of a library, it will automatically come in with a, a list of the attributions that are put in place there. So saying content came from this page right here that is written anonymously. This is a flat world knowledge book. So that's how we had to acknowledge that. Here's the license that's connected to it. If we have uh, the appropriate source connected to it, which we were not technically allowed to within this infrastructure. Uh, we have that all in place. And if you click on this button, it will actually highlight the block on your page and where it came from. And that makes it very effective and convenient in order to be able to slice and dice these things effectively and still be legal and ethical in the way that we're following OER. Uh, uh, we're very excited off of it. And it also gives you the ability in order to use content and mix content on a page that may not be compliant with a single license, but because you identify the licensing uh, on the page individually, you can put a collection, a notification on that page, meaning no license, single license applies, and still use it effectively like that. Um, the what I, the other thing I want to mention, and this will be coming out, uh, or you can see it at any time on any of our pages, is that we have a new, uh, and since I have this open here, uh, uh, to Andrea's uh, book, uh, <clears throat> we have a new reader mode. And reader mode uh, is a new interface that's going to be our default interface to books. Uh, and it gives us a mechanism in order to view the book uh, from a reader's perspective, so you don't have a lot of other issues connected to it. Uh, but it has other features connected to it, not just the table of contents, um, but uh, we have the ability in order to make references. So if we want to have ancillary materials, what's oftentimes found at the end of the book, because uh, I'm a chemist, I want to have periodic table uh, that's available. And this starts to to basically take into account that the book that we want to deal with has to be a dynamic using interface, not just basically a static book that you hand out there. And this provides the opportunity in order to build your book into a much better learning experience than just basically here is a physical copy off of here. We have references, tools, and a handful of other things that's connected off of there. We're very excited with the reader uh, view. It also provides us greater capabilities in order to handle full WCEG compliance for accessibility, uh, which uh, I am going to be talking about momentarily. Uh, we have a wide range of dissemination mechanisms for the Libreverse. Uh, <clears throat> so while I mentioned that we've delivered 1, million page, 1 billion page views uh, since we started 15 years ago, so direct uh, interaction with our, our 
website is the primary uh, interface. Uh, individuals can download PDFs of the books, PDFs of the chapters, PDF of individual pages. You can embed those books and pages into your learning management system. Um, you can get the print files that you can upload to uh, Lulu Express or upload to uh, Amazon or other printers as you want. Uh, we will have an EPUB export uh, option available. Uh, we've been uh, slow in being able to get this out over the last couple of years due so, to some technical problems, uh, but you'll be able to then use that with uh, EPUB readers. You can print up uh, uh, physical books. We have a, we act as an intermediary in order to be able to take our the content stored on our page and push it to Lulu Express, so you can actually get it printed up at near cost. Uh, without any uh, significant overhead. Uh, so it's not, again, we operate as a not-for-profit. Uh, we can also embed the books into Raspberry Pi boxes, and those boxes can be hotspots. So those can be used uh, in order to access the repository if you have uh, limited or no access to high-speed internet, whether that's because uh, you have students don't have the right, uh, don't have uh, appropriate affluent um, access to money, or they happen to be uh, in underneath the ocean in, a, in the military, uh, in a submarine, or you're climbing uh, the Himalayas, um, and you have the ability in order to do it. We, we developed this as part of a mechanism for distributing content to developing countries, um, and we're very excited about that, although we discovered that uh, during the pandemic that there were a lot of communities in America that had limited internet access. Um, so. Okay, the bot server. So one of the key components that I said that distinguishes us from other repositories out there uh, is that we curate the repository. And we, we go in and we edit the content out there because we're subject matter experts or we have access to subject matter experts on our curation boards or outside of our curation boards. So if something needs to be addressed or something needs to be changed or there's a mistake and there are mistakes across the board everywhere, uh, we can go in and we can update it near instantly in order to be able to address what needs to be updated. So we take curation very seriously. And we have a, uh, a range of curation tools in order to be able to facilitate that. Now, these tools are not available to the average user, but it does give you the idea that, uh, or at least the concept, uh, that we take curation uh, very seriously and we go through the effort in order to be able to uh, update these things uh, and uh, implement that. I think Lauren asked a question. Could you explain what you mean by we when you refer to curation addressing what you do? Okay, so for example, if a so if people write content, and lots of people are writing content across the board on our site, they will write content in various levels of accessibility because they may not have the um, training in order to write accessible content. Uh, many of our bots are designed in order to go through pages in order to update uh, writing, update HTML, the underlying code, in order to convert it into an accessible uh, uh, version. So that's one of our uh, curation board aspects. There are other issues out there in terms of how people are uh, had format, formatted things in different ways. Um, it's all part of our standardization. It's all, and when I say the word curation, I mean actually getting involved in touching and updating that content. So, um, uh, we are typically quite reserved in updating other people's content. Uh, we we do cent, uh, pay a lot of effort centralizing the central content with the exception of making sure that the standardization necessary in order to be able to remix effectively is put in place and that there's some level of accessibility uh, uh, in place there. Nothing beats a full level uh, accessibility review though. Uh, so uh, speaking of accessibility, if you want to be fully compliant, you need to make sure that you have both your text, your organization, your videos, your homework, interactive elements, and basically everything else needs to be compliant with WCAG 2.1, which is the standard that uh, is used for the internet today. And we have several mechanisms in order to address this. So one was the the, the those bots I mentioned before, this curation tool that will go through and update pages in order to be able to reflect uh, changing accessibility or if things were not accessible to begin with. Uh, the other thing that we implemented into our editor uh, last year is a real-time accessibility checker. Now, the criteria that we use in order to evaluate WCAG has about 81 uh, entries onto that list of criteria. So uh, we don't actually go through all those criteria automatically, but we go through the top 10 of the biggest issues that uh, plague uh, 
authors in constructing accessibility compliant uh, content. For example, um, legends, uh, box legends or heading legends and such like that, or alt text and things like that. So this provides a mechanism to do real-time checking as you're editing. This is, again, part of our commitment in order to uh, be as accessible as possible uh, and to provide authors to be able to, uh, to generate content as accessible as possible. Uh, actually, this is a copy from the other slides. Okay, the Jupyter Notebook system. Um, so the, it was clear to us that we wanted to build the textbook of the future. And I'll use that term several times for the remainder of this presentation. And the textbook of the future, um, it's the future, so it's unclear exactly what it's going to look like. But we do know at least I do believe, it's going to be a textbook of technology. It's going to be a textbook that facilitates interactivity. Uh, it's going to be a textbook that actually starts to capitalize on emerging technologies in order to advance learning, whether that's learning learning uh, protocols uh, or learning capabilities. So one of the things that we implemented is a Jupyter Notebook system within our infrastructure, within the Libreverse. So the Jupyter Notebook system, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a technology, it's a beautiful technology, um, that uh, provides the opportunity, at least within the context of our books, to embed uh, executable code uh, that you as an author uh, can code up or as a student can actually code up and run uh, and, and essentially make it so that you can your book becomes more than just text or more than just images. In this case here, this is a quantum mechanics class that I teach uh, and having students getting exposed to particle in the box. Uh, if that means something to you, uh, congratulations. If it doesn't, uh, it's not overly important. The key aspect is that the students can see the code uh, and see it rendered right here. They can come in and they can edit the code and see how it's reflected off of here. You can build widgets off this code. This is Python. Um, you can add R, you can have Octave, you can add uh, up to 30 languages within Jupyter that can be embedded into the textbook in order to build the textbook of the future. Uh, uh, which is critical uh, for teaching of um, STEM fields. Because we capitalize on building a centralized system that is uh, facilitates community involvement and that infrastructure uh, that Jupyter provides us gives us the ability to capitalize on other people's code, just like in OER where you can capitalize on other people's content that you bring in, uh, like Andrea's uh, book that I just showed before. In this case here, um, there was an individual that presented uh, some Python code in order to make, uh, in this case here, a distillation a phenomenon that I just happened to teach in my general chemistry class. So I was able to take his Python code. He presented it here in Twitter, grabbed it, plugged it in, and had students interact directly with this immediately, capitalizing on, again, the community that we have in place. So the commons and conductor. I'll be talking about the commons and conductor in more detail later on this term. Uh, this week, that is. Uh, I'm very excited about the Commons Conductor. Uh, the Commons Conductor is a very peculiar name. Uh, so the front end of it is the Commons, which is our cataloging infrastructure. It's a mechanism in order to be able to showcase the books that you have um, that, for people to be able to do searches and find it. Uh, and they don't have to go directly to our libraries, although they are also perfectly fine to do that. The back end of the Commons Conductor is the Conductor. And that right there is a project management tool. Uh, and that was meant in order to facilitate facilitate the construction of OER content. Uh, it was a project management tool designed for OER. Uh, and we tried a handful of other project management tools and none of them were ideal for what we want to do. So we just decided to build it. Uh, this is open source material. Anyone can grab it and, and run it, although it re requires running on a server. But you can also get a free account on here at commas.libretext.org. I encourage you to take a look at it. I'll show you a couple screenshots in a moment. And again, I'll be going over in more detail later on this week. So the Commons provides a front end catalog. That's a public facing interface to find books find the libraries, find collections. So you can actually make sub collections uh, out there to have collections of homework. Uh, you can even use it in order to identify what projects are being constructed uh, within the commons infrastructure. There are two types of commons. There's the Libra commons, that is the centralized commons that the Libra text team runs uh, for ourselves. That's at commons.libratex.org. And there are campus commons. So when a campus joins our Libra net, uh, what they get off of that, or one of the things that they get, is an instance uh, that is a branded uh, 
it's branded campus commons for them. So it showcases that campus's books for those campuses students, for that campus's instructors, for that campus's administrators, for all the stakeholders that be, would be relevant in order to showcase that campus's books that are out there. Uh, the conductor, the back end, is private facing and requires an account in order to, to sign in. Again, it's freely available for anybody. Um, now, the interface and the, the, the capabilities of the back end uh, conductor uh, is, if, is optimized for building books on the LibreText. However, nothing says that you can't use uh, the interface that we, we've built here in order to build things off of the LibreText, whether that's ancillary materials or if you, heaven forbid, go to Manifold or, or Pressbooks or some other platform uh, that isn't us for hosting these things. It's a project management tool. It, it provides an alert setting. So you can go in, you can say, tell me when a new book it, it comes out that has this in the title or this in the keyword, like calculus. Tell me every calculus book that comes in in the near future so you can be uh, on top of things. It provides a mechanism for harvest requests so that if you have an OER, con uh, OER book that you want to have harvested into our infrastructure, you can request it via that. It gives us a mechanism to facilitate adoption requests which means that we can centralize adoption reports and provide adoption reports to people about their books and where they're being adopted out there. It provides a mechanism for facilitating peer reviews, whether those peer reviews are students, maybe not necessarily peer uh, reviews, but reviews by students or reviews by faculty. Um, it provides a, a mechanism for communication. That's communication uh, amongst uh, within the team, intra-team communication, or inter-team between one team and another team that may be in a different campus building a different project, or with the construction uh, team itself um, that facilitates greater communication uh, across the board. Uh, you can then see uh, any progress on any public project that's available uh, out there on any other instance that's out there. This right here is the front end, the commons uh, end of uh, Prince George Community College, uh, in in Maryland, uh, and you can see that you know of the sixty one books that are in their repository, uh, it's only showing twelve of them, but there are a whole lot more that they can then do searches and find them uh, in various ways. The back end for that, this is an example of a um, in this case here, it's a beginning uh, healthcare Spanish <laughs> OER manual. Um, uh, and it has a range of different people who are involved in the project. It can identify different levels of development, uh, whether it's construction, peer review, accessibility. You can look at timeline peer reviews as Gantt plots. It has uh, a beautiful accessibility infrastructure uh, and a handful of other things that I don't have enough time in order to do it justice because I'm just kind of doing a topical overview of the Libreverse, but I strongly encourage you if you have a desire in order to learn more how to use this thing, uh, uh, take a look at uh, the presentation that we have set later on this week. Uh, or go to commons.libradex.org and register for your own account and start playing with it. Um, part of the Libra, uh, part of the Commons and Conductor also has integrated analytics. So this goes back to the fact that we're an instructor and we want to be able to evaluate the efficacy of what we created. So the number one uh, metric in order to decide what is a successful book, whether it's OER or commercial, is whether that book is successful in instilling learning. That's it. That's the number one goal. It doesn't have to be pretty if it instills learning. Uh, it doesn't have to be beautifully written if it instills learning. Uh, it would be nice if it were that that case. You can also argue that it doesn't have to have DEA if it installs learning, but DEI, sorry, uh, uh, is is critical in order to facilitate learning. So that's not really uh, an either or situation here. We want to be able to implement an analytics infrastructure, uh, and this is what we've done. So this is a study that we did. Uh, uh, close to eight to nine years ago, uh, which just shows what happens when you get detailed information on how students use this book. So I taught two back-to-back -back classes of 500 students. So this term, I taught a thousand students. It wasn't entirely enjoyable, but uh, I did it. One was using the conventional commercial textbook and one was using the Kim Wiki, the precursor to the Libra text. Uh, and this right here is one term, this is the summer term. Uh, and I just wanted to argue, uh, the, the point that we wanna get is actionable information. Uh, so this gives you detail on page views, total page views per day. Uh, and what you identified here, or what you can see is that there's massive studying right before the exam. Cramming, uh, as you can say. <laughs> and if you believe that cramming is bad, and this is our study actually showed is about 10% 
lower performance for crammers than non-crammers, assuming that that's a cause and effect, which is not entirely true. It could be a causation. Um, I mean, it, it could be correlation. Uh, uh, so we wanted to be able to reduce the cramming or the be study beforehand. So I did weekly quizzes. So this was a mechanism in order to use this detailed information of analytics in order to guide my pedagogy. Uh, that that's out there. Uh, and I use it all the time. This is the learning analytics infrastructure that we have today. We're going to be updating these things later on this spring. This gives an example that you can have right now for any book that you have adopted uh, uh, via the Commons and Conductor. You can identify, in this case here, is looking at uh, all pages it, it viewed over the course uh, per day. Uh, you can see that I have an exam right here. I have an exam right here. I'm looking at a specific page in red in order to see how the students are reading. So in other words, when I ask students to read, I can then check to see our students reading. Uh, and I can use this as a mechanism in order to guide my pedagogy uh, and also uh, look at individual students in order to identify if there's intervention that's necessary in order to be able to address that student, that class of students, or even the entire class as a whole from these analytics. We're very excited in order to release this. We're very excited in order to advance these things uh, in the upcoming uh, months, especially thanks to new investment of funds from the state of California. So forums, I'm going to quickly go over it. We have some community forums at forums.libretext.org that people can come in in order to uh, reflect some questions or issues that they have. Um, our our curation boards use the forums themselves and also to be able to curate. We're probably going to fold these things into the commons and conductor uh, and use this as a social media-like uh, presence within that infrastructure. We have a Discord channel, which is a real-time uh, feedback mechanism. So if you go to chat.libertex.org, uh, authors, students or so can come in, uh, typically they're authors, uh, and they can ask questions. And many of the student developers on the project are on this chat board and they're able to respond directly, uh, as is many of the uh, student, many of the development team um, that are the non-student development team, that is. Project Solo. Project Solo <clears throat> we're going to be releasing, or we have released, but we haven't really given much feedback off of here. The idea behind Project Solo is a standalone mini Libreverse. Uh, it's a mechanism that can actually uh, run like courseware via Drupal that you can actually host books, but you can host courses. It hosts H5P as a repository infrastructure, and it can be run outside of the Libreverse. So individuals can actually run this on their own campuses uh, in their own countries uh, as a mechanism in order to be able to distribute uh, OER content. And we did this, uh, we built this for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons that we were particularly interested in is we wanted to make sure that we were able to distribute our content as freely as possible to the world. But there are many places that won't, uh, that insist on having OER, open source technology running on their own platform, let me phrase that, on their own computers or their own campus or their own state in order to host the content and not just within our uh, Libreverse infrastructure that's, again, centralized. So this provides a mechanism in order to advance into a decentralized approach, but still significantly coupled into the central infrastructure that we then curate and cultivate. Um, and we're very excited about this. Uh, it has a lot of capabilities, and we hope to expand this uh, in a variety of different uh, <clears throat> communities, especially, for example, uh, many K-12 campuses, uh, schools, uh, don't have enough money in order to purchase learning management systems. And this provides a mechanism in order to take the place of a learning management system. Uh, it's not a full-blown LMS, but because it's based off of a uh, content management system, Drupal, it has a lot of the capabilities there in order to be able to advance that. Uh, and it's, again, open source that uh, can be utilized or we can run it for uh, those campuses at near cost. Um, I'm going to skip over the the nature of the networking and how that actually facilitates it between the solo verse and the Libreverse. And I want to talk about the last topic, which is our adapt homework system. So again, we knew that we wanted to be able to build uh, a portfolio of technologies in order to advance um, OER in the classroom. It's a practitioner's goal off of doing that. And we knew that we needed homework in order to be able to do that. The problem with that is it's actually kind of a pain in the butt in order to build a homework infrastructure. Uh, because there's lots of features uh, that's involved in order to be able to make that work. And there's uh, lots of components that need to be addressed appropriately uh, in order to make sure that it handles all the appropriate legal protection, security, uh, accessibility, and other things off the place. It's one of the reasons why uh, 
uh, there are only a handful of open source technologies out there for these sort of things. Uh, so, you know, the, the question that I would ask is, how do you build an online homework system that complements the utility of the Libre text infrastructure as that flexibility that we have implemented in terms of being able to mix and match effectively in order to make it so the community is able to move forward instead of uh, as small little steps, but as big, large steps off of each other's uh, aggregate effort. And we want to be able to build something that's flexible, dynamic, comprehensive, integrated, LMS agnostic, because we don't want to be connected in any one specific LMS uh, and powerful and free or nearly free in order to be able to operate. Fortunately, the state of California invested uh, funds in order to be able to build this system, which we refer to as ADAPT, in order to be able to do that thing. The answer to that question is that we need to do it slowly and efficiently. We've been wanting to build a homework system for the last 12 to 13 years, uh, but it's just it's we've gone through lots of um, dead ends. Uh, and until recently, uh, we've been um, we've been missing this component, which is important. Now, in building this homework system uh, that complements these textbooks that I mentioned before, we want to capitalize on open source technology, capitalize on the sharing is caring model that underlies open licensing, whether it's OER, open source technology. So we don't want to recreate the wheel. We want to capitalize on what has already been created. Let me skip over this. There's a little bit of things here and just go into that. So the upshot behind ADAPT is ADAPT is designed in order to capitalize on a not one specific technology, but multiple technologies in an interconnected umbrella uh, scaffolding uh, that people use off there. Uh, it, it can involve, it can use web work technology, uh, which is a technology that's used for uh, predominantly upper divisional math and statistics and engineering classes. Uh, it can use IMath AS. That's the technology that underlies MyOpenMath uh, or Lumen's OM uh, infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> and, and both of these have very comparable capabilities in terms of very algorithmic uh, issues, but they're also particularly painful in order to code up if you're unfamiliar with coding in Perl or PHP uh, languages. Uh, we capitalize on H5P, uh, which is much more uh, convenient in order to be able to build because it's easy in order to build, it's easy in order to distribute the content. Um, uh, and then we've capitalized on QTI, which is question and test interoperability. That's the protocol that's used in learning management systems. So it's not quite a technology, it's just a format uh, that's out there. Uh, and ADAPT essentially takes all of them. Uh, so if people have a, a course in web work, they can integrate it into ADAPT. If they have a course in IMath AS or MyOpenMath, they can integrate it into ADAPT. Um, most LMSs, uh, you don't have courses of H5Ps, but you can have a collection of them. Uh, for example, in a, uh, in a WordPress instance or a handful of other instances. Uh, or if there's a question bank in learning management systems like for example, in Canvas Commons, we can integrate it into our platform. The key point is that we bring all these technologies in. You don't need to master all of them by any stretch of the imagination. You master what you need in order to address what you want. And by doing it in this flexible manner, it means that you're not limited to one specific technology uh, and the limitations uh, that are associated with that technology. So in some cases, it's useful in order to have a graphical interface of H5P, but H5P is not very good for security purposes because it's client-side evaluation. It's actually quite easy to hack into. It's not very good summative uh, capabilities. But web work takes a lot of effort in order to be able to understand how to code. Uh, QTI is a lot easier to use because it's like your learning management system, but by having them all at the equal level, you can make it so instructors can choose one technology or another technology and build assignments off these technologies without having to worry about the details uh, the specific to how they are used effectively. So this is a traditional way in which we view this. Uh, this right here has a, a set of different courses that have been constructed. These are the courses that are in my, my instructor set. So these are the ones that are at UC Davis. Um, but we have um, over about 5,000 students that have been using this over the last year and a half. Um, the idea, again, is to uh, have flexibility for multiple auto-grade questioning capabilities. We also have multiple open-ended question capabilities where you can upload text, files, audio, uh, record audio uh, as a way that requires humans in order to evaluate the content to be flexible uh, in place. It's designed in order to be multimodal. 
uh, you can access it through the ADAPT website at adapt.librodex.org. You can embed those questions into your book, both formatively and, and summatively. So your book then becomes the homework system. Uh, we will be releasing a mobile app soon, so students can actually interface directly uh, to their questions with the mobile app. This can be then used as in-class clickers. Uh, so if you want to pull your class uh, for interactivity in your class, you can then use the uh, bring your own device uh, infrastructure, and they can all be coupled into your learning management system via Passback, via uh, QTI um, uh, interface, uh, via LTI interface. Um, so this is a quick example of a of the snapshot of the the uh, the app. The app is uh, being designed at the University of Arkansas Little Rock. Uh, and they're doing a beautiful job so far, um, and we're very excited in order to be able to release it uh, in the near future. Um, and if anyone has a, a desire in order to test drive that, please let me know, uh, and I can uh, I can give you the the files in order to be able to address that um, to load it up on your book on, on your phone and uh, and evaluate that. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, a lot of potential uh, off this thing. This is just about done. I wanted to just show a quick, um, quick snapshot of just an H5P exercise that's uh, on the app. And then, okay, that app is no longer available. I know it's supposed to be coming up here in a second here. There we go. And that's an example of a web work question um, that was that was quick there. So if you make web work questions, you can embed them and make a, a portfolio of uh, questions for these things. The reason ADAPT is called ADAPT uh, is that it's named after uh, it. It's named after adaptive learning capabilities. So we have learning tree capabilities. So you can actually, instead of having individual questions, you can have a set of sub skills necessary in order to master the trees, master the, the content that's in the, the root assessment. This provides a mechanism for students in order to get remediation in order to help address the issues that uh, may result in failure or poor performance on the original tree. Um, I, can, I will go into that in more detail later on this week. Um, the studio, is our repository for H5P. Anyone can have access to it if you go to studio.librotex.org. I encourage you to take a look at it if you want to see the H5P repository um, or contribute to it. Um, and that I will end uh, with what I started, which is our mission statement. Uh, we are implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. We're very excited with what we've created. We're very excited in order to have people utilize our content, uh, use and utilize our technology, and I encourage you in order to do so. Um, and with that, if you, uh, if you want to stick around, we can uh, address any questions. Like I said, we're going to have a lot of videos later on this week that will go to individual components of the ADAPT in order to learn details that you may, that I obviously had to skip over here. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Yes, Sarah. Hi, I, I'm uh, fairly new at this. I'm the new OER liaison for Antelope Valley College. I teach for College of the Canyons and Antelope Valley College. And uh, so I attended the kickoff in, last Friday, March 3rd. And one of the issues that was brought up about LibreText, I'm not certain I understand this, but it was about whether you should copy and paste a textbook into your course or embed it. And it seems like they said there were multiple problems with embedding it because it's a link and yet you have to embed the Libre text in your course if you get a badge to use that text. Now, I'm not sure what all that means, but perhaps you can make it clearer to me. Well, when you say kickoff, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, I'm, I'm brand new as mm -hmm. a representative for the Academic Senate, California Academic Senate OER, to report to the Academic Senate there at Antelope Valley. They right. are just, I've been using our OER uh, texts and information and resources for a number of years. But in order to relay it to the Academic Senate and to really improve and increase the OER presence at Antelope Valley College, I'm supposed to attend these meetings and interpret. So I have been using for, I, I teach history mm 
Mm -hmm. And I've been using the OpenStax U.S. history and African-American history and other sources, world history. But I'm not that familiar with Libre. And one of my uh, department, former department chair, was asking me about a Libre U.S. history text. So I wanted to be able to explain what's available to him. Well, at the, the OER kickoff last Friday, that was to orient new liaisons for okay. the California Community College District. So I'm a new for the, liaison. Oh, for, for the OERI. Right. Um, okay, well, um, <laughs> so if you if you grabbed one of the uh, Canvas shells uh, and you embedded uh, uh, OpenStax into it, OpenStax does what's called tiny uh, or thin common cartridge. And that's also what we do. So in other words, when you open up the page, it will... Uh, it looks like it's you see it in your page, but you click on it. It really is grabbing it from the uh, the OpenStax website. Right. OK. And that's the same thing that we do. Uh, so there's nothing different uh, between that. In fact, uh, they almost all do that. All the platforms off of there. Uh, so you don't you you rarely actually store the textbook, which you can. You can store it in a common cartridge and embed it into your book. Uh, uh, but that's typically not the case that's that's done. Okay. Um, All right. I, I don't know what she meant by a badge. That may be a term that the California Community College. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, do you know who, who told you that? It was Jennifer Paris with College of the Canyons. Okay, I can I can ask Jennifer what what's going on with that. Uh, I'm and, not entirely sure what the the, the badge is uh, off of here. Uh, the I, I've not encountered any issues associated with uh, embedding of thin common cartridges uh, into the uh, canvas, uh, but I can ask to find out what this badge issue is, and then um, I can we can uh, follow through and get back to you about that. Okay, well, what I've done with my U.S. history book is simply provide a link and I have my students download the entire textbook so that they have it at their disposal on their laptop or computer. You can do the same thing, I assume, with the Libre text. Yeah. Yeah. If you prefer to go about doing that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Audrey says quality review through POCR. Still okay. Not, that that yeah. that sounds correct. That does sound correct because we are using POCR at ABC as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just go directly to Michelle Pilati and find out what, what this is all about um, and then that we can address it. I was just chatting with her yesterday, so uh, uh, I, I'm not familiar with any issues off of here. Uh, and we can address them quite quickly. So, okay, uh, Lauren, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, I'm. thank you for this overview. This was super helpful. I'm wondering for campuses, what is your feeling about campuses that have successfully utilized Libreverse? Do you, is it best to have sort of a one point of contact? So I'm the open education librarian supporting faculty across a very large campus. I had emailed with you, Delmar, a little bit about um, presenting to our chem faculty this Thursday. And so I'm trying to get a sense of like how much on campus, um, you know, what kind of on-campus support makes Libra text most successful for campuses? Like, is it sort of like faculty and departments adopt it and they use it and there's not a lot of central management that needs to happen from someone like me or the libraries or, you know, instructional designers? Or is it, um, do you usually have like a one point of contact who's like the administrator of Libra Text on that campus? Um, well, it's actually both. So it's always a good idea to have one person as the point of contact uh, or at least a, a team that's a point of contact. Um, so that comments and conductor infrastructure uh, that I showed before uh, is a mechanism that's useful in order to uh, uh, showcase uh, it to organize these books. Uh, so for example, if I want to go to a, like, let's say, say I grab Highline College. So just a little north of you. Um, 
uh, and they have their own portfolio of um, of books that they have available. Um, but uh, if I I have to log in as them, I can't log in as my, uh, myself because I see everything. Um, but mm -hmm. they they have when you go into the conductor on the back end, you have each of the books, uh, each of the projects that are being prepared in order to do. Um, so they can uh, they can go through that in order to be able to identify. I can. Um, I'm not answering this very well because I'm trying to uh, to dovetail us in different different things. The it, you know this is a, a project that we have a variety of different projects that are in place. Some of these things are harvesting projects. Some are individual projects that we have uh, we have organized and for a variety of different things. Um, but the, it provides a mechanism so that one person and uh, can go in and identify what are the projects being done and what's the progress going on what's the communication that's involved in in that one like here's a uh, here's a uh, uh, sexuality the self and society book and here's a series of conversations dealing with uh bringing that book in uh, and it's very convenient for <laughs> being able to use this as a mechanism to manage it but the bigger picture is uh, i i recommend having someone who's actually sort of the point person that's involved mm -hmm. in being able to to do this across the board. Uh, that could be a librarian. Um, I tend to find faculty to be the ones that are a little bit better suited for that, mm -hmm. but you, they need to have the time and available in order to do that. Right. Um, is, is Phil Reed still up in, in administration or did he uh, step yes. back? Okay. Yeah. Um, so technically the the money, the, the, the US Department of Education grant that we received five years ago did mm -hmm. have UW as a, a sort of a, secondary correlate uh, secondary member via phil uh uh because i know phil and also because uh, i graduated from from there and everything like that um so but things kind of uh, dissipated over a period of time and didn't really get back going again so if there's a a, a desire in order to have a greater conversation ar around getting that back into mm -hmm. the speed then um i think it's a good idea in order to do that i, I have a strong right. desire in order to go back and, and get the uw going because there's a lot of stuff going on especially in biology less so in chemistry but um uh it, but it, i mean yeah anyways i'm babbling yeah. a little bit here uh <laughs> okay. it, it, yeah I, hopefully i addressed your question um yeah. Yeah, and I'll I'll follow up. Um, I appreciate your email, and I will I'll I'll follow up with you because I have an upcoming presentation and want to just kind of you know structure it correctly and everything. So I yeah, that was great. That was super helpful, and I'll I'll follow up. Thanks so much, Delmar. Which library is your office in? I'm in the Odegaard Undergraduate Library. Odegaard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a, this Suzilo, Su Suzilo, what's the beautiful Suzilo. one? Yeah, Suzilo, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, gorgeous, I still remember it, so, uh, okay, um, let me uh, transition on, I look forward to uh, further conversations, uh, Mustafa? Yes, hello, uh, well, Delma, I, I just wanted actually seriously to again congratulate seriously the uh, Libovis team who has been working on such a comprehensive project, seriously. And uh, at every time I hear you talk, though, I just, it brings a lot of hope in uh, what uh, OER had been promising for many, many, many years. And uh, through the ecosystem that I am seeing, I see really a lot of options to address all those questions. So I, I guess the, the, I have, I need time myself really to get uh, to learn a little bit more about all the elements of the ecosystem, the way that you presented it. But when it, uh, when it comes to community, it is obvious to me that really a research, really, because when I listen to all the Libraverse and the community, you did not emphasize too much really the research component that's gonna be needed around all this, you know? You and I know, because we've been in it for many, many years that really effectiveness has to be measured, you know? Uh, providing faculty with all these analytics, that is quite frankly excellent. But as part of the, the, the Libreverse, really that faculty community that's going to be dealing in with measuring effectiveness and practices, I think right. is really going to be a key. I see that you did not emphasize that, but I'm sure you, you, you've been thinking about that as well. Thank you. Well, 
Yes, I, I I was already five minutes over uh, without question answering, so I, yeah. I didn't have time in order to go that. I, I will mention that this new influx of funds that we got from the state of California for expanding ADAPT through the California Education and Learning Lab had a component uh, in order to scale up the analytics that I mentioned here. Uh, it, so what I wanted to be able to do uh, is uh, – make it so that we can identify multiple classes that are running in the state of California. So let's say you have a specific class like Calculus 101, whatever that would happen to be. And it's taught in basically 150 public uh, schools in, in all three of the, uh, the systems in the state. Um, we can, and if they use ADAPT, we have the ability to track it and then we can start to identify best practices. So in other words, we can say, okay, well, here's the, the wealth of classes that use this, that deal with that same subject matter. And we have a nice little infrastructure called um, CID numbers that gives us the ability in order to say, this is what that specific topic is in that class. And then from that, you can say, okay, well, the, from the grades and the performances and ADAPT, we're collecting lots of information in order to be able to identify, well, this instructor at this campus right here appears to be doing a good job. Uh, and then, then the point is, let's talk to that instructor, find out what the instructor did and or does in order to do a good job, and then uh, reflect that back out to a, a community of practice centered around that. So this is multifaceted in terms of collecting the data, analyzing the data centrally, uh, and then uh, identifying uh, and facilitating uh, a community of practice from the best practices established from that. And that's part of this new fund, these funds that we got. And it's also part of a greater initiative that I want to push in the state in order to be able to scale this thing up uh, uh, very strongly into uh, a program that I call uh, Cal Open. But uh, that's still uh, in its initial stages in my head right now. Yeah. That is great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that. But just uh, understand that California is just really a sample, though. And you're talking about really a Libraverse. And in the verse, I understand really the universe. In California, for instance, you don't have historically Black college and universities. So the student population, where you're going to be collecting the data, going to be extremely important. But anyway, we can get back to all this discussion. But you're, I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. At least yeah, you, you're, you're right. That. I mean, the, the issue that the, the reason I do in California, is it, it's a I can it's a bite size whole bite size I can grab from. Yeah. And, and the, the current money from there comes from the state. The second one is that because the, the, the state has a CID infrastructure, it makes it easy in order to be able to evaluate the same mm -hmm. type of class in multiple campuses. You don't many other states don't have that sort of infrastructure in place. Yeah, it, if you can find it locally, it says, well, this class is this class and this class is this class. I'm trying to organize it but california is just convenient you just say cid is you know math 105 and that right there is this class and everybody syncs up it makes it really really easy for doing so absolutely. it doesn't mean that we can't scale it up it just means it's going to be a lot more painful in order to do something absolutely thank you so much thank mm -hmm. you yeah take care